Dire MSC class, dire MSC alumni, dear members of the ISTS Foundation, dear members of the scientific committee, dear professors, dear distinguished speakers, dear sport friends and dear families, welcome. My name is Claude Stricker. I am the executive director of the AISTS. This is the opening of the 11th MSA. This is the opening of the 11th MSA, a graduation ceremony of the Master of Advanced Studies in Sport Administration and Technology. Today, we are in the company of six Bob Slay, reminding us of the evolution of sport equipment and the impact of technology over the century, a touch of emotion. And who here is the best to talk about sport technology with emotion? Please welcome AISTS President and EPFL Professor Jan Anders Manson. Thank you, Claude. So, ladies and gentlemen, you are very, very welcome here. And I must say, especially graduate students, uh, you that are going to graduate, this day is fully for you. And we hope it will be special. And what makes it very special is all the family and friends that come from all over the world, fly in from Korea and uh, wherever you come from. This makes it special. It makes it memorable for us and for yourself. And that brings the right memories to a day like this. It's also special for us teachers. Being teachers is sometimes terrible. People, you start to like them, you love to have them around, and they leave happy and you stand as sad yourself. <laughs> and, but you get used to it when you get old and gray hair. You start to live with it. But there is a memorable thing. We meet again at different sport event, uh, places around the sport event around the world. We see you, and it's the big uh, payback for us when we meet you happy out where you're working. There is one thing I would like you to remember. You know it's tough out there. It's tough to get job for everyone. And you leave with a degree and you say, bong, I can choose among hundreds. The world isn't like that. And that's for a very important you remember. You are ambitious people, for you applied to this uh, uh, degree, to take, take this one year here. You are special, for we selected you among a lot of people. And finally, you are also good, for you are graduating. So, don't, never forget that. Then if there is not job when you come out like this, there is job. And that is the encouragement you should have, that it's not about you, it's about society. And if the society is not good right now, blame us. Do better than us. Do better so there is more opportunity for young people out there. That is the important thing. And don't forget the value of the, your degree has probably never been higher than right now. Our Recognition in different ranking is really good. And this is due to we getting good students, they go out, they do a good job, and our, our ranking goes up. So, by that, I let the event start, and I leave the world back to you, Claude. So, you're all welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jan Anders. Dear sport friends, we are very proud to share with you that as of tonight, we have a total of 349 AISTS alumni who have come from all continents. Many of them have been hired by International Federation, a demonstration that the international profile of our program answers well the needs of our sport cluster with qualified personnel. We would like to give a heartfelt thanks to our partners, allowing the MSA to develop in a nurturing environment. The International Olympic Committee, the federations, the sport companies, 
as well as our founding members, the universities of Lausanne and Geneva, the EPFL, the IDEAP, the IMD, the Ecole Hôtelière de Lausanne, the State of Vaux and the City of Lausanne. And a special thanks to EPFL for the efficient hosting of the MSA on its campus. IESTS is a not-for-profit foundation created in 2000 by a Bove institution to develop the pool of competence in education and research with the aim of reinforcing the competitive advantage of our sport cluster. And last but not least, I would like to recognize the effort and contribution of our scientific committee all sitting here. Let me present my view about the skills I believe are important to future and aspiring sport managers. This is based on what I have learned in my past lives as an athlete, as a physical education teacher, as a volunteer in sport association, and as a coach of fathers and fathers of skiers. As we say, only the surfer knows the feeling. By this, I mean that you, sport managers, if you want to be good at your job, must, you must know the inner feeling of sport. This is my first point. Don't only talk about sport. Understand sport. Do sport. Be a coach, a volunteer, or an athlete. We live in a very competitive environment. Industry, art, entertainment, sport, even charity now have become more and more competitive fields. But the good news is that there is nothing better than competition to make you and your organization excel. The ability to stay focused, to accept failure, to develop your awareness of risk, and to become a hard worker will help you compete. The true courage is not the one-time exploit, but the courage to wake up every morning and work hard through your day, practicing, repeating on and on and on until you succeed. I strongly believe that the sport manager's mindset must be competitive, as competitive as the mindset of their professional athletes. At AISTS, we actually face competition with other management programs from the very beginning. And the competition continues to increase. Every year, you have new programs popping up in all countries. The good news is that the MSA now is strong, and the results speak for themselves. First, we receive more and more applications. Second, over 80% of our alumni have found a new job in, the, in sport the following year of their graduation. And three, the MSA is ranked third in a world ranking of best sport management program in the world. But after 11 years, the journey is not finished. No sleep. We are ready to work even harder in order to provide the best service ever to our MSA participants and to our alumni. So this is my second point. Embrace competition and fight. As we have learned from economic science, value creation is correlated with creativity and innovation. I believe there is much room for more creativity in sport administration. And it's need to be inspired by the coach, by the best athletes, and also by the sport industry but it also needs to be inspired by you, you as the next generation of sport managers, because together with sport managers, the best coaches, athletes, and breads are indeed factories of innovation. That's why at AISTS, we develop our participants with more and more skills for entrepreneurship. We now actually have a dedicated seminar on sport entrepreneurship and have alumni who have created their own successful Startup, for instance, in this example, our alumn has raised 10 million of Swiss francs for his, its investment. So we want sport managers in sport federation with ideas and creativity, bringing fresh air to the world of sport. So this is my third point, creativity. So just do it, compete and create. But above all, of course, stay humble. I wish you, MSA graduates of tonight, an exceptional success in your career and full happiness with your personal life 
and your passion for sport. Well, I would like to present our next distinguished speaker, Ms. Anne-Catherine Lyon, Head of Education, Youth and Culture at Cantonovo. Ms. Lyon, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you not only for your support of the development of the sport cluster in our region, but also for your support in the development of the network of haute école spécialisée, in particular for the haute école spécialisée de musique, MU, music school in Le Flan, which offers a very qualitative environment for studying music. In fact, our four musicians tonight are all students at MU. Linking culture and sport has always been important as we recognize the common thread between artists and sports people, both driven by passion and hard work. Thank you sincerely. Dr. Stricker, thank you for your very kind uh, words. Ladies and gentlemen, dear graduates, dear family and friends, I am very lucky and very happy and very hon honored to be here today. And as I was coming here this afternoon, I thought it was the first time, in fact, that I was invited. And when I think that AISTS has nine mothers, nine founding members, and I am part of four of the, mo of the mothers, I think it's time that I should have been invited. And it's particularly nice for me to be here today because I think that the state of Vaux, where this program is taking part, is a very fortunate state in Switzerland. And we would like to name that state as the Americans do. You give names to your states. I think we should name this state the Swiss education state because there are only two states in Switzerland that have the good fortune of, hab of having a polytechnical school. It's the state of Vaux here in Lausanne and the state of Zurich. Both of them have an EPF L or Z and uh, we have all the type of universities. You have mentioned the universities of applied sciences and we have Lausanne University, the EPFL, and many private universities of a very, very high quality, and they are part of the founding mothers. And also, we are the most fortunate place in the whole world because we host the HQ of the International Olympic Committee. And Every day we think that it's such an important decision that was taken many, many years ago and we still every day think that we are very fortunate to be the hosting place of that such so, that so important committee for the whole world. Lausanne University, just over there, is becoming little by little but surely one of the most important center of competency in sport. We have just uh, inaugurated the new center in all its dimensions and as you have mentioned Dr. Stricker we will have uh, in a very few months ahead a new building all dedicated to sport and sport administration. This building will be called the Sinatlon and will be the building that will have in its walls ISTS. We are also very happy to have such a diversity of students of so many countries of the world coming here to study in that program because we very deeply believe that we need ambassadors around the world and I am very impressed to see the map of the world and to see over 300 graduates become, that have become alumni that are ambassadors of the state of Vaux of that program and of sport in general. So I wish you the best, all of you that are graduating today. And as it is almost the end of the year, I wish you and your families a very, very Happy New Year and a lot of pleasure 
in your life, in your personal life, professional life, and I know already that you are very dedicated people, because otherwise you would not be attending such a program, and the world needs very dedicated people. And also to finish, to see, it was very nice, funny, nice to see the little uh, movie just there, and to remember all of us that we are all different, but in fact we are all the same, and we all belong to the same planet, and we have, I think, a duty, every one of us, every day of our lives, to make the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lyon. Our next speaker is well known in the international and local sport community. He is the sport director at the International Olympic Committee, working with all international sports federation. Soon he will be the next executive director of the Olympic Games, one of the key positions of the Olympic world, succeeding Gilbert Feli. We all wish him the best of his, in his new role. I think the best way to present Christophe is to say that my three key points for sport managers illustrate exactly what Christophe actually is. He knows the feeling. He is an accomplished and still very active sportman. He is one of the hardest worker and competitive persons performing in his job, and is a highly respected director for his excellence in serving the Olympic movement. And three, Christophe has the entrepreneurial drive. He supports new projects, new ideas, bringing enthusiasm and fresh air. Before Christophe speaks, here is a look at the best of the Winter Games in the lead-up of Sochi 2014. We thank the International Olympic Committee for quite kindly providing us this video. Well, as for you, I don't know. On me, this has always the same effect. Goosebumps, heartbeat. For you graduate, if you have the chance to join sport, and we have a few in the room that, that already have joined organizations, remember one thing and one thing only. Our business is about experience and emotions, ultimate emotions. When you think about anything in our business, it's the delivery of an experience to spectators, TV viewers, athletes, participants, to give them emotions, something they will take home and remember. Madame Lyon, graduates, professors, friends, gives me great pleasure to be here with you this afternoon for this graduation ceremony. I've got quite a long agenda, but I think it will be much better that I keep it around six, seven minutes intervention and then I'll move closer to you and I'll have a few questions for the graduates. So start thinking about what is really important in sport right now. What are the current trends? Because you will get the answers. One moment to shine. How many of you? 30? Be ready. First, a few words regarding AISTS. We have a fantastic and, and dynamic relationship. As you can see on screen here, the numbers are pretty impressive. So we have a very rich collaboration, one that is useful as well. It is delivering not only great programs, but great individuals. I saw that we have currently 10% of all graduates working within the IOC. And in the sports department, I can't see behind the spotlights here, but how many in the room? In the sports department, two, three, three, four maybe? We have Varun as well, at, at, uh, somewhere in, in the room. So we're probably over the 10% margin here, which is an excellent news, because with what is coming ahead, and I will speak about 2014, you will see that many opportunities will arise in the IOC in the next few years. Not later than three weeks ago, I was having dinner. It is part of the, uh, of the function, yes, through dinners as well, um, with the president of the Squash Federation, and he was telling me how great the relationship was and how helpful you had been in revamping and thinking strategically about the development of the sport. This is one of many examples. 
So thank you, AISTS, for everything you have done, we are doing currently and will do in the future. You are truly, truly helpful. 2014, the year ahead, is an exciting one. We have new leaders in key positions in sport all over the Olympic movement, and it is very refreshing. We have renewed energy, we have fresh ideas. I don't know if you have followed the campaign for the presidency of the IOC, but you had many, many ideas. So thinking about creativity, what is up for in 2014 is a lot of it, a lot of it. We have uh, next week in Montreux, the executive board that gathers for five days thinking about developments for the future. What are the good ideas? Which one we should filter down? Which one we have to implement? It's starting with the executive board. We'll then go to Sochi, introduce working groups, and by the end of the year, we'll have an extraordinary IOC session to decide about the implementation of these measures. We have fresh blood in the IOC administration as well. We have three new directors, uh, Kit McConnell, who will replace me as of 16th of, of January, exceptional gentleman coming from IOC to start with, but rugby after for a number of years. So Kit will head over sports. We have a new finance director, Lana Haddad. She is half Iranian, half from the UK. She's the finance director. International cooperation director will, will be Lindsay Glasgow. She's coming from Canada. So we have fresh blood within the uh, IOC directors as well. So quite an exciting year ahead. And as I said, since we have all this transformation and all these new ideas, it makes no doubt that this organization will continue to employ and will need to have exceptional people. Immediately um, at the end of, of the year, or turning the year, we have Sochi. A few words about Sochi, um, and the, the main ones are about the new events. It's quite daunting for an organizing committee to uh, uh, inherit from 12 new events, three years out from the Games. We have, uh, you, you can see them on screen, one of the questions will be on one of the events here, and I'll see whether we have a, a, a good knowledge around, around the population here. Uh, so Sochi 2014 faced 12 new events to organize, but it is the duty of the IOC to look at the sports program, which is, in the end, the product we sell, the one for which we gather quite a lot of resource that in turn help the National Olympic Committees, the international federations to develop themselves. It has to be successful, it has to be appealing. The program is very diverse, it is very rich, it has to cater for all tastes, all cultures, all generations. If we look at Vancouver and London, we have an evolving trend among the youngsters especially, which is a much higher follow-up of the Olympic Games than it was the case previously, which is an excellent sign that the product is still appealing. We had some doubts when uh, the ratings were going down in the younger generation. One thing that is super important in sport at present, and this might explain as well why it is a, 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 an evolving trend in the younger generation, the packaging of these two games was exceptional. Sport might remain the same. The way to package it can be truly different and make a, a whole world of difference. If you look at the colors of London, they used purple, pink, red, quite difficult on TV, but it, it gave a, a radically different tone. The music, the backdrop of the city was different, so the sport might remain the same. If the packaging is different, it can have a true re revigorating effect. So this is what we have ahead of us, Sochi, with, uh, for the first time as well, a, a coverage um, uh, in, in uh, full HD and uh, the, the flicker-free technology. I don't know if you saw the images of Vancouver. Some of them had this technology whereby if you shoot aerials in, in skiing, for example, you could see the eyes of the athletes through the, through the goggles. It is a super high definition and especially in slow-mo. The images that will come from uh, Sochi will, will be truly exceptional in this respect. So what you will see is about 500 hours of live coverage of the highest quality. 
normally we should, we should get excellent ratings, despite, especially in Europe, not a, a so favorable um, time difference. We have, we have three hours, so it can be challenging, uh, especially for, uh, for the evening sessions. Now, now I can see you. Now I can see all of you. All right. So why don't we do that? I've given you just a highlight of what is coming up in 2014, but you've been studying sport from various angles. Now let's try this. I'm going to ask a few questions uh, to the graduates, and if they don't, the, the professors will be the backup. <laughs> Pressure is on. And if you want to play a trick, no one raise the hand, and that will be the professors. Right? Big data. Who knows big data? Graduates, big data. OK. So I want you to describe to me, in general terms, what is big data and how it could influence sports. Um, in s I actually did a research with uh, ASWIF, so I dug a little into this. Um, but big data is pretty much, I guess, in simple terms, um, the overflow of information coming into the games, whether that be the statistics, whether it be historical results, uh, biography of athletes, there's an abundance of information coming into the games that needs to be organized, uh, curated, and presented in a way that's, uh, that's simple for the viewer to really take in and, um, I guess, appreciate. So it's all part of the experience with the Olympic Games. And that's how I found Big Data. And there's lots of technology that's um, involving this right now. I mean, you got mobile, you got, uh, you got all the websites that are, are, are changing all the formats that are adapting to this. So there's lots of technology that's, that's hovering around this Big Data. And it's becoming a huge um, component to, um, I guess, organizing sports and managing sports because it's, it's, it's never ending and it's just only going to grow from here. So that's what I guess the Big Data. Good. <laughs> I hope that and answers would, it. It, it was clear enough. Yeah, there is abundance of information, and this information is helpful. And what big data will help us in sport organization, it's to reach down with ultra capillarity the audiences in a much more targeted fashion, because especially through the second screen, especially through social networks, we are able to understand what the consumers want. So this abundance of information is helpful if we can understand how it is consumed. The main thing that will come in the next, few, in the next um, for us probably Rio will be the start, probably Tokyo is when it will be matured. We'll have, and all, all legal people here, uh, think about it. The next set of data that will be generated are personal data on athletes themselves. Heartbeat, stress level, power, personal data. How do we cope with the issue of propriety of information? Who does it belong to? The athletes. Uh, sense, producing the, the results. We, we saw uh, one of your, your graduate from 205 that created that company. Legally, what challenges do we have if we want to collect data from the athletes and release them into the public. Maybe we don't have a challenge. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. Someone else. And by the way, I don't know the answer. <laughs> then I guess it's for the professors. So, uh, so you have two, two aspects. Thank you. Uh, first one is uh, consent of the athlete to be secured when, whenever feasible. This is easy in your, in your context because they all have to agree to the rules uh, of the event, etc. So you can simply put an additional paragraph. You have enough uh, legal people around at the IOC to have this. Then it's every single nation or very developed and sophisticated nations have uh, uh, something on data protection. And maybe 
even the consent of those athletes might not be enough, might not be valid. So this will be the big issue, I guess, for the IOC in the next years, having those very personal, sometimes physical aspects presented to the, to the public. So there might be countries where the protection is, or oh, maybe the individuals are overprotected in your eyes at the IOC, so that even though the athlete would consent, this consent would be considered not valid by the tribunals in each of those countries. So you have to negotiate something at the global level, I guess, for this type of, of activities. Thank you. So th that, that might be uh, a practical work for um, yes. one of the next students, right? Okay. I heard, I heard uh, thank you very much. I heard Claude saying that um, we have to go out there and, and be on the field of play, right? So what we have all done in sports organization is try to get more numbers behind the screens. So what I'd like to know is how we get people behind the screens so that they are inspired, but more importantly, how these inspired youngsters, or not, will be on the field of play the day after. Because viewing is inspiring, practicing is much more fun and healthy. What do you think sports organizations should do? How can we convince people to watch TV, which can be detrimental because it's part of the, of the time, you know? It's, it's everything is a question of balance. You have time to watch TV, read a book, socialize. How do we make sure that they go out on the field of play? What is, what is missing if something is missing? Yes. I think, I think people need a hero. I mean, um, if, I mean, the U.S. is the best example for it. Um, if you look of, with um, it, sport, literally broke the barrier between the races. So, a lot of, if you look at black African American kids, they all say, "Yeah, I want to be LeBron. I want to be Michael Jordan." These people are the heroes, meaning that they know that they can be successful through sports. And that inspiration of watching TV, watching, let's say, LeBron James coming from whichever neighborhood, and he says, wait, I come from the same neighborhood, I'm with the same area, we have the exact same conditions to succeed, and if he can do it through hard work, through not watching TV, but actually participating in the match itself, I can do the exact same thing. So it's all about actually generating and creating this hero figure, or there's someone who can inspire to, some kind of a mentor, if you take it from the business side, or you take it from the sports side, he'll be, um, he'll be a leader. So all these guys who are actually brands these days, people want to, you know, um, collaborate with them and get in touch with them. And the only way is actually through participating through sports. So I think while participating, you can succeed. That's the answer. Yep. And I think you're, you're, you're right, and it, it has probably a bit more to it, but you're right about one thing. The, uh, the big athletes, LeBron James, um, Roger Federer, they have about in between 15 to 50 million of followers on, on the social networks. So they are, uh, I'm, I'm afraid to say, to the media, uh, to some extent bigger than traditional media in most cases. So it's true that they are, they are really inspiring and, and they can help. What we need in sports system as well, um, coaches that, that evolve with the new generations. When we did a study prior to Copenhagen, a lot of the youngsters dropping sport said two things. One, parents, parents, and now that I've read this, you know, every time Jules is going out of, of the, the tennis court or, or anything, I never say, did you win? I said, did you have fun, right? Parents, fundamental. Some federations have gone into booklets of education for parents and coaches, because coaches do not recognize education. Coaches, they want performance on the field of play. That's what they paid for. That's what they are designed to do, maximize performance in the athletes. And what we have to do is make sure there is a balance in an athlete that is an individual that starts with education, then gets into sport, develops some life skills, and has to transition towards something else. So there is a revolution in mind in sports organization
to make sure that sports performance is one of the aspect, but not the whole. With this, I think I've, I've taken the 20 minutes, right, Claude? So thank you very much for, uh, for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe. It's always great to hear from the graduates themselves on a day such as today. But I still have another question, another quiz. I'm sorry to continue the pain. If I tell you 1984, which Olympic Games, you say? Sorry? LA? Sarajevo? Is that correct? Sarajevo. And if I tell you bronze medal in bobsleigh, and bobsleigh is the sport of today, as you could understand, what do you say? Giobellina, Silvio Giobellina. Please, a big applause to Silvio Giobellina, who came from Leza to attend this event. There. And you will have the opportunity to, uh, to cheers with Silvio after the ceremony. Before I introduce our next speaker, I would like to take this moment to remember a great person, Mr. Nelson Mandela. He was and continues to be an inspiration to those who seek and fight for freedom. He was a champion of peace and human dignity and recognized sport as a powerful way to overcome prejudice, violence, and injustice. You probably all remember the 1995 Rugby World Cup in South Afri Africa. And speaking about South Africa, I would like now to say that, dear Nathalie Dutois, it is a great honor to welcome you in this ceremony. No words can be strong enough to describe your achievements. We are pleased and grateful that you could join us tonight, making such a long journey all the way from South Africa. Please. Welcome Olympic and Paralympic swimmer, Mrs. Nathalie Dutoy, for the keynote address. Good evening, everyone. I think I'm going to stand in the middle so that everybody can see. Now, does anybody know anything about swimming? No one. It's difficult. Okay. Tonight, what I really want to share with you is a life story. Um, I, I hope that I can motivate some of you in, in different ways. And really, it's who I am today has been 22 years of a swimming career. I want to start with just showing you a couple of pictures um, about my life. And some of them are very random, but I will explain some of them to you. Um, and hope you enjoy it. Now, I started swimming when I was six years old. And for those of you that don't know much about swimming, I will explain a little bit about swimming. But it was, I was a little girl, and my older brother was a, a top swimmer. And I was always dragged along to watch him swim. And I absolutely hated the water, so some of the, the pictures of me as a, as a child, I was always crying when I was put into water. And one day I was sitting on the side of the pool, and I said to my mom, I want to swim and I can swim. And she laughed at me because, obviously, with the history and everything. And I got into the pool and I started swimming. Now, my, stroke, first, my first stroke I could ever swim was butterfly. Everybody know what butterfly is? I don't think, I, I, I don't know if I swam above the water or below the water, but, but nevertheless, I started swimming. And I started enjoying it and I started realizing that I could do well. And I started winning some competitions within, within Cape Town, living in Cape Town at that stage. And I, it was just my passion. I just got into the pool. I trained three half an hour sessions um, a week. I was 12 years old when I qualified for my first South African trip and we were going to Crystal Palace in London. I come from quite a poor family in South Africa. My parents actually couldn't afford for me to go. And in South Africa, if you can't afford to go, they would send someone else in your place. And about two weeks before the competition, um, one of the girls in my team's parents offered to pay for half my ticket 
And my parents said, okay, well, we'll pay for the other half. Now, I didn't have any pocket money, so I actually walked down the main road in Cape Town. It took me about four days, and I managed to, to collect about a thousand rand, and in those days it was six rand to the pound, and I was going to Crystal Palace. I actually walked into a factory called Ina Palman, which is a, a sort of baking product factory, and I managed to meet the lady many, many years later, and she told me her story about how she actually came to be successful, and it was quite amazing because all of us seem to have a similar road that we follow. We go through adversities, we go through failures, and we go through successes. And I was going off to Crystal Palace, and I got there a couple of days before the time. And the gala started, and I won a couple of gold medals in the Victrix Sidorum. And I came back to South Africa, and everybody had said that I would be the next Olympic champion and the next world record holder. And that was my opportunity. And I didn't really see it as too much of an opportunity, but I got into the pool and I started working hard. And I started loving it. I started training an hour a day at that stage. I was 14 years old when I moved to a Hungarian coach. You would have seen a picture of a whole group of us. Now, I always think he looks like a gollywog um, with very, very curly hair. And I was 14, and I started training four hours a day. And it was a lot for me, going to school, doing music at school, swimming, playing water polo, playing netball. I was one of those busy athletes. And I just believe that you've got to go out there and enjoy absolutely everything. And we had our national championships in April in 1998. And I sat next to my coach because everybody was sitting next to him before a race. So I thought it would be a good idea for me to do that. And he handed me a white piece of paper. And on this piece of paper, he had written down a time of 4 minutes, 55.86 seconds. And I looked at him and I thought he was absolutely mad because I was swimming about a 5 minute 16 at that stage for a 400 meter individual medley. So it's two lengths of each stroke of an Olympic sized swimming pool. And he said to me, Natalie, it's possible. I know what you've done in training and I believe you can do it. This time will not only qualify you for Commonwealth Games, but you have to go out there and make sure you come first. And I just laughed at him because it was just insane. And I went up into the call up room and I talk a lot when I get nervous. So all my competitors generally sat on the other side of the call-up room. And I went up for my race, and I stood behind the block, and you would have seen a picture of me at the Olympics, and I, I focused quite a bit just before my race, um, and focused on just being me, and being able to get into the pool and give everything. And I got up onto the block, and the gun went off. And as I dived into the pool, I remember my coach saying, stay, next, stay quite close to the girl next to you, because she'll probably win it. And our butterfly leg, I was about a length ahead behind the goal. Backstroke came up and I was round about at her waist. And I was getting further and further behind. So you get a little bit despondent. But I knew that the breaststroke leg was coming up. And I knew that my coach always said that there's going to be people who are talented at breaststroke and those that can't swim it at all. So I was hoping she was one of those swimmers. And we started the breaststroke leg. And I started catching up. And I started looking and I knew I was going to get into trouble because you're not supposed to look at waste time. But the first length of freestyle came up and I did a tumble turn and we both happened to look in the same direction. And it was about the last 50 meters and the race home. And coming into the, the flags, from the flags to the wall, my coach again drilled into our heads from training that you don't breathe from the flags to the wall. And I came in and I touched the touch pad and I looked up and I swam four minutes, 55.94 seconds. And I not only had I qualified for Commonwealth, but I placed first as well. And it was a lesson for me, because I was 14. My coach had said I would ex swim exactly that time. And for me, it was amazing, because it set me up for the rest of my career. And it said, it's possible. You can believe in your coach. You can believe in the team around you. We've all done extremely hard work. And it's possible to achieve it. I went off to Commonwealth Games later that year in Kuala Lumpur. I got there a couple of days before the time. And the first day of competition comes up, and we were busy warming up in the main com in the warm-up pool. And I, my coach said to me, okay, well, get out. You can go and put your costume on and go and report for your race. Now, thank goodness in those days we had normal costumes. Nowadays, our costumes take me 27 minutes to put on. It's fantastic because it keeps all my fat in, but trying to tackle the fat in is crazy. And I walked around the time board and I saw Natalie Detoy and I thought, fantastic, you know, everyone says that there's someone with the same name as you and someone that looks like you as well. And I thought, it was an amazing time for me to see this. And the race started and they all came down to my end and I realized that no one was in the lane. 
And when I looked up at the time board, I'd realized that there was a South African flag next to Natalie Detoy. So it wasn't another person, it was actually me. And I went up to my coach and I said, Crowley, I've just missed my race. And he said to me, what do you mean? I said, well, my race is swimming and I'm not there. And he said, what do we do now? Now, I have no idea what we do. But media had started arriving. And I said to him, I have no idea what to say to them. He says, don't worry, I do it. And he did some media interviews. We found out that I had to apologize in person to the starter, to the officials, because if I don't, it's seeing as though you're trying to put your competitors off now. I never quite understood that because I was this youngster that nobody knew. And swimming against you know, your, your top athletes like your Michael Phelps or any of those athletes, I mean, I didn't even know them. I didn't think they would know me. But nevertheless, a couple of years later, I realized that there were a lot of youngsters that come up and beat those older kids without them even knowing. And it was important. We apologized in writing, we apologized in person to the starters, to the officials, and they said that they would only tell me later that evening if I could compete in the rest of the competition. And I go, remember going back to the hotel and my coach had done these interviews and I phoned my mom. In those days, it was still reverse call charge because we didn't have cell phones. And my mom said, what's the story? Because there's such a bad negative story going around. I said, I don't know what you mean. I was really just warming up and I missed the first race. It wasn't my main race, but it was a race. And she said that my coach had gone out and said it was due to human error, but people picked it up as woman error because of his accent. So my first hint of media was extremely negative. It was something that I believed that I was a failure. I believed that I'd let my country down. I believed that the other girl should have gone because she had a lot more experience than what I did. And when I was in South Africa, there was a handful of people that said that she should have been there, not me, because she had that experience. Nevertheless, I came back to South Africa, and swimming wasn't the same. It wasn't about loving it. It wasn't about beating the person next to me. It wasn't about me being a butterfly swimmer and swimming individual medley and trying to be better in pulling or kicking or whatever exercises we were doing in the pool. And everybody said to me, but Natalie, you're going to be the champion. And I didn't believe it. It took me over a year to get around that so I could believe that I could be the best that I could be again. And as I went through life, I realized that it doesn't matter how long it takes you, as long as you believe that at the end of the day, you can actually get through any adversity, any failure in life. And I got back to swimming because I knew I had to get back in the pool. And 2000 came up and it was our Sydney trials for the Olympic Games in Sydney. And my coach again sat next to him and he handed me this piece of paper and I thought it was going to work like clockwork again. I went out for my first race and I missed qualifying by over four seconds. My second race, which was the 200 meter butterfly, four lengths of butterfly, I missed by just over a second. My 200 meter individual medley, I missed by 0 0.03 of a second. And again, all you want to say to the organizers is, you know, in a, about a month or two, I'm sure I would have to send a 0 0.03, but it doesn't work like that. I hadn't done it at that point in time at that particular competition in that event. And yes, again, to me, it was a failure. And how do you get through that? And so 2001 came up and I was still trying to get through all of this and trying to enjoy what I was doing and love getting back into the pool again. And I was actually on my way from training to school when I was involved in a motorbike accident. Now, bearing in mind, my, dream, my big dream is to get to the Olympic Games and swimming. I've now, a car has driven into me and I'm lying in a road. I can see more or less the damage to my leg. I had steel cap shoes on, I had chinos on, I had a golf shirt on, I had a jersey, a blazer, I had a jacket with a reflector belt, I had a helmet and gloves. I thought I was prepared. And yes, I was lying then, I could see the damage to my leg. My foot was one way, my knee was one way, and I was in a lot of pain. And the first person I could see was a lady who actually used to wax my legs, which was a very strange thing. But the second person was actually a guy who was holding my leg together, and he'd witnessed my whole accident. And he was telling me about his kayaking experience. Now, I've never been kayaking in my life, so I had no idea what he was talking about. But somehow he was calming me down. And all my swimming friends on the way from swimming to school managed to go past me, and some recognized me, some stopped. My coach was there. The ambulance arrived about an hour and a half later. And when they got to me, they put up a drip and put me in the back of the ambulance. And I remember saying to them that if the drip falls on me, I'm going to sue them. Now, again, where that comes from, I have no idea. I hope the morphine was working by then. But I got to the hospital. And I, I believe I sat in a passage till half past four that evening before they eventually x-rayed me. Um, 
And yes, a lot of people say that tissue dies within an hour, two hours. But I saw the pictures and seeing all the damage to my leg, I actually realized that there was no ways that the, they would be able to save my leg. Now, my leg had burst open as if you drop a tomato on the ground from my knee downwards. In the top half, I broke it in three places. So in my femur, three places, one straight through the center of the femur, a centimeter below my hip and my kneecap. And yes, it's a challenge. And being in hospital, I finally got round or came around about two days after my amputation. And I looked at my mom and I said, when am I going in for the operation? And she said to me, Natalie, you've already been. And you look down and you see that your leg is about double or triple the size of what it was. So I was more worried about if I had to wear a size 40, 32 pants, what size pants I would have to wear. But I had some people come and speak to me in hospital. And some of them were psychologists. And I kept telling them about my life story. And eventually I said, I think my parents need them more than I do. And why I said that was because every day I wake up, I put a metal leg on. Every day I know I go through all the challenges. I can't just walk upstairs like everybody else. It was all the small things that I couldn't do that I really missed. But every day I deal with it. So yes, psychologists came, disabled people came to visit me in hospital. And 90% of them said they wish it never happened. There was one person that walked in and he told me all about how he's run the Comrades Marathon, Boston Marathons, and I couldn't understand it because I didn't see anything wrong with him. And he then took his shoe off and I laughed because it looked like an elephant's foot. And then he, he told me all the problems that he has with it. And I realized that every day, each one of us goes through, as I said, failure, adversity, and it's how we deal with it that's important. So for me, it was never a question of, can I get back into the pool? Can I get back into swimming again? Would I be an Olympic champion? Would I not? It was, let's see what we can do. And I got back in and I started swimming and my time started improving. I started swimming disabled in a pool. I started swimming able-bodied in a pool. And again, because my time started improving and I started doing better, the belief became more of a reality. And I believe that maybe it's possible that I'd one day be able to go to the Olympics, the Paralympics, and be at the top of the game again. And so yes, that was the challenge. And one biggest challenge was that I couldn't swim breaststroke. And my coach took me aside and he said, Natalie, put your head in a little earlier and dig deeper with your left hand and you'll be able to swim straights because everybody else was swimming into me at that stage. And I did this. And again, it was the most stupid reason to give me, but it allowed me to swim breaststroke and allowed me to actually leave the sport having achieved everything possible. There was nothing more that I could actually achieve. Now, yes, getting into swimming again, in 2006, two coaches came up to me and said, Natalie, we believe that the 10-kilometer event will be an Olympic event. And I looked at them and I laughed because who races two hours? That's just crazy, you know. Again, who wants to race in a pack because you get hit, you get punched, you get scratched, and I'm, I'm not the fighting type, so I really don't like it. Even though, you know, when the officials aren't looking, a lot happens, but... <laughs> so I started swimming five kilometers, and I started swimming one hour, and I started... I started winning it in South Africa. And in 2008, it was May, our South African team left to go to Beijing. And I was told I had to be top 10 in the world to qualify for Olympic Games. And we got there the night before and everybody laughed at us because they'd been there for a week, two weeks already. And everyone said to me, do not swim with a brand new scientific racing suit, which I did. I had everything in my backpack, thank goodness. It was the first time that I actually had people there to support me that were, that were friends, that were family, and it made the biggest difference. And they called us one by one onto the pontoon, and I remember the gun going off and racing. And I said, kept saying to myself, Natalie, just hang in the middle of the pack until the last lap of two and a half kilometers or three kilometers, and then you've got to start making your move because you can't sprint at the end. And the last three kilometers came up, and I went around a boy, and I noticed that something must have happened because seven of us had pulled away from the rest of the pack. And I started sprinting for two and a half kilometers. I gave everything. That stage, I was swimming six hours a day. I was training. And yes, it's a lot, but I knew I could make that last two and a half kilometers as a sprint. And I came in and touched the touch pad, and I looked up, and I placed fourth in the world. And you come back to South Africa, and then you said that you can't go because they weren't counting on you qualifying. But I'd made it, and we managed to get to Beijing and managed to race and I managed to swim the Paralympics as well. And it was probably one of the most successful competitions of my career. But as I went through all of that, there were many, many lessons that I learned. And it's actually become a brand of mine and that of values. 
And I want to share some with you today. One is hard work. I trained and I got into the pool and did an extra two hours more than everybody else so that I could be on the same level of them at the beginning and therefore be able to beat them towards the end. Teamwork. I would never ever have got anywhere unless I had my team. Now you would have noticed a picture of me sitting on a pontoon and I was smiling. I just come forth and qualified for Olympics. But at that particular time, I had a prosthetic leg that I left at the start and I waited about 45 minutes for them to eventually let someone through to bring my leg. And it was tough because, yes, I am able-bodied, but at the end of the day, I was slightly different. I only had one leg and people don't see that. And yes, that becomes diversity. And yes, although I wanted to be able-bodied, I had the small problem. And I didn't accept it at first and I had to eventually start accepting it that I'm, I'm going to sit on the pontoon until someone actually realizes that I'm not the same, and so I had to get someone to help me. And it's tough because I just wanted to achieve what I wanted to achieve. To have no arrogance, to go out there, to know that you've done the work, to know that you can achieve it, but without being arrogant with people. To have the respect, not just for yourself, not for your team, but for everybody. No matter if you're the best or the most successful, there's always someone that will try and reinvent themselves to be better than you. And you've always got to go out there and, and keep bettering yourself. And to have empathy, to recognize that we are all different and we all have different experiences. To have perseverance. I went through 22 years of many ups and downs, bad, ne negative publicity, good publicity, but I had a dream in mind to reach the Olympics. And I managed to achieve it after those 22 years and to believe you can. In those days that I had self-doubt, it was about my team that kept me going. Now yes, some of us are confident, some of us aren't confident. You would have seen a picture of me patting an elephant. That was one of my dreams, to go to the Kruger National Park. And I managed to realize it about a week before I went. But for me, it was important to have small goals, to have big dreams, and to go out and achieve them no matter what. When I was 12, when we went to Crystal Palace in London, I didn't go to Madame Tussauds, but in 2012, I managed to go. And the only picture I had was of Shrek. Everybody knows Shrek. In swimming, you can be confident, but in life, I'm not so confident. However, sometimes I can use the confidence from my swimming and use it in life to, to make me forward or to make me propel me forward. So yes, it's finding ways of, of trying to achieve, trying to be better than you can. Today you graduate, it's a new step, it's new opportunities. And opportunities only come around every now and again whenever we're ready for them. And it's to grab that opportunity and to fly with it. Yes, I had that opportunity when I was 12 and that allowed me to be who I am today, to meet the people that I've met, to have the passion for life, to learn the values, to have ethics, and again, to be who I am. So my message to all of you today, I wanna to leave you with this, and it says, the tragedy of life does not lie in not reaching your goals. The tragedy of life lies in not having goals to reach for. It is not a disgrace not to reach the stars, but it is a disgrace not to have stars to reach for. So aim high, dream big dreams, and remember, everything is possible if you can just believe. So go out there, have those goals, have those dreams. Today's a celebration, and use that celebration to go out there and be the best that you can be. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing your story with us, Natalie. I think it's safe to say that everyone will leave this room inspired and move by your outstanding accomplishment. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite the president of the AISTS MSC Alumni Association, Mr. Diogo Yurema, who is very actively developing the growing alumni community. Please, Diogo. Wow, <clears throat> beautiful, amazing stories here. Uh, thank you, 
Thank you, Natalie, for sharing those. Thank you, Claude, in the STS, for inviting us, the alumni committee, to be here. Uh, actually, I have to confess, I'd much rather be on the, on the audience side, listening to stories such as those that we are witnessing here. I actually love stories. I learn, I feel, I picture things more through them. I think that stories, they shape our lives. Uh, in my personal case, they help me to give, they give me perspectives. Uh, from the alumni uh, point of view, what I mean is, I've seen uh, alumni colleagues from my year, for example, 36 year olds, taking internship position and creating a, no, a whole new story from that point. They highlight the importance of experience as well. I've seen alumni from years past mine who had a very established career in the private sector. And at one point she decided that she wanted to pursue her career in sports and that she wanted to apply her experience in the sports world and live a happier life, I guess, in the sports. Uh, domain. Stories are also a source of inspiration, as we have seen here today. Uh, I had, I, I, when I think within the alumni uh, community, uh, it was also brought up here a work of an alumni colleague of ours from 2005, who comes from a different country, arrives here, had a vision, pursued that vision, created a product, a unique product, and he's there making his story. So the alumni committee story for the past year and a half has been a little bit about soul seeking. So we did, we did a bit of uh, strategic planning within our organization. We have developed new projects, alumni led projects, projects that come from our community, people who have ideas in Sometimes we only support them so that they can carry on that story. And we have also taken the opportunity for the past year and a half to reinforce uh, existing programs that we already had, like the mentorship program, for example. So with the support of the ASTS, more and more, we have been able to get our community of alumni together and develop new stories for every one of us. So what is your story? What are your stories? The next speaker is an alumni from 2006. She has also a great story to, to share with you. She was here uh, a few years ago and now she's all the way from Australia to share a little bit of these uh, exciting stories for us. So thank you very much. Good luck. And Ann Gripper, please come share your story. <laughs> thanks, Diego. And uh, particularly thanks to Claude for the invitation to be here today. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be back amongst the students and to uh, relive some of the, the graduation ceremonies that I attended while I was living here in Switzerland. Um, today I'm actually not going to talk about really me or my involvement in cycling or even triathlon now. I'm actually going to talk about um, a scholarship that has been happening here at the AISTS um, for three years right, now. So I'm going to talk about a scholarship but more particularly about uh, the June Canavan Foundation um, which has uh, provided the resources uh, to have a scholarship here. Um, so really before I start, I, I want to talk about June herself. Um, and this is really all a, a, bit, a bit of a, um, a testimony to, to June, who also herself was a graduate um, of the MSA in 2006. So there's really, I couldn't put many words about June because she was a lover of life and, and she was one of those people that no matter which community or which group of people she was with, they grew to love her as well. So first and foremost, uh, she was a, a sports physician. 
Um, she was a doctor who, who was one of the very first specialists in sports medicine and used to really get a, a huge amount of satisfaction um, helping athletes to find their way through complicated illnesses and injuries. And she developed a, a reputation in Australia as being probably the best person that any athlete who had had a long-standing injury or illness that they couldn't get over. June was the person that would be able to fix that. Um, after she uh, graduated here in 2006 and in fact won the, uh, the Best Student of the, the Year Award in that year, she actually continued working and lecturing uh, in the Sports Medicine and Sports Science module of the, uh, the MSA. Um, as Ms Leon said earlier in, in this afternoon, we all have a responsibility to, to make the world a better place. And, and June really didn't ever feel that as a responsibility. It just, just happened naturally to her. No matter what she was involved in, it was all about making the world a better place. So I thought today I'd just give you, a, for those of you that knew June, um, just give you a little bit of an update on the, uh, the foundation that we've set up in her honour. Um, again, for those that don't know, June was actually killed in a plane crash um, flying to Kokoda in Papua New Guinea in uh, August 2009. And she was uh, raising money um, for a, uh, a school in Tanzania. It was a project that she was working on climbing five peaks starting with K. Um, so she was up to the fourth one in Kokoda and unfortunately the plane that she was in crashed into the, the, uh, the mountainside there. So with the foundation, it was pretty easy for those of us that, that had some decisions to make to decide to put all of June's assets into a uh, foundation that was all about doing good things. And our vision is really June's spirit living on as an agent of change, as an agent of change for, for well-being and justice around the world. We, uh, we concentrate on four areas that were very close to June's heart. Um, so we decided to focus our giving um, to sport, to projects in health, to projects in education and conservation. Our, our largest partner is the School of St Jude in Tanzania. Um, it was the, the school that June was actually raising money herself for um, when, she, when she died. So we've continued on with the School of St Jude as being um, uh, quite large financial supporters of the school. Um, it was a school that was started by a young Australian woman called Gemma Sissia. And uh, she started this school as a means of uh, really educating and creating the leaders of Tanz Tanzania of the future. We also uh, provide funds to, us, to several other international projects. Um, Alola is a foundation that looks after the health and well-being of mothers and children in the, the new nation of Timor-Leste. Um, we provide um, scholarships through an organisation called Motivation Australia, which works predominantly in the South Pacific and Fiji. The Mercy Ships um, are, is, a, is a big hospital ship that moors itself off the coast, normally of West Africa, providing humanitarian aid there. Project Vietnam and our Yani Moala Foundation. So Yani was actually the pilot of the plane that crashed in Papua New Guinea and uh, her parents set up a foundation in Papua New Guinea which, uh, which we all also support. We also have quite a lot to do with Australian uh, wellbeing projects. I won't go through them all, but we have two main um, geographical areas in Australia, so the Sunshine Coast, which is where June lived and had her sports medicine practice, and um, an area of Victoria called Wangaratta, which is where June spent her early life. So one of the things that came very uh, naturally to me um, on the, when, when June passed away was to really recognise the time um, that we'd spent here together in 2006 and that June had continued to, to, to work with the, um, with the course. It just seemed very natural for me that part of her legacy would be creating something here um, to perpetuate what, what she'd been involved in. So June and I were both very much part of the early years of the Lausanne Network for Women in Sport and we decided to work through um, the LNWIS to actually create a, a scholarship um, that furthered the aims um, of, of what, the, um, what the network trial was trying to do. So um, I decided that the scholarship would be to offer a, a, a female from a developing country um, who, was, who could clearly demonstrate that, that she was passionate about um, improving the involvement of women in her home country 
um, to actually come here and have the opportunity to do the MSA course. So just to finish off, I'd like to really congratulate and recognise our, our three scholarship holders. So in 2011, which was the first year of the scholarship here, we had Tysa. Tysa came from Brazil and uh, she's currently working as the media relations manager for the uh, 2014 FIFA World Cup. So extremely high pressure job for Tysa um, and fantastic that she was able to come here for a year and, and develop the skills and the competencies that enabled her to go back to her home country and actually take on such an important role um, in the FIFA World Cup. And as, as well as that, she's doing lots of other things that improve the uh, involvement of women in sport in a, ra in a range of areas in, in Brazil. In 2012, we had Carolina. So Carolina comes from uh, Colombia. And um, she, after finishing the, the course here, she then had a really good uh, role at Sport Accord. Um, and this year has worked on some really exciting projects that culminated in the um, organisation of the Sport Accord uh, Convention in St Petersburg. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, I met Carolina briefly at the London Olympics and uh, looking forward to spending some more time with her um, over the next couple of days. And this year, graduating today, again congratulations, is Aya. Aya is from Uganda and um, has now secured a role with the World Health Organisation. And I guess the parallels between Aya and June were quite remarkable. Um, Aya herself is a, a medical practitioner with a, a specialisation in, in sports medicine. Um, she was an elite swimmer for Uganda. And June's main sport, the sport that she um, was the team doctor for for many years in Australia, was swimming. Um, so the fact that Aya was this year's scholarship holder was just a, a wonderful match for us. So really, I just wanted to say um, congratulations to the, the three scholarship holders. Um, I haven't had a chance to spend much time with any of them, but look forward to being part of their continual um, development in sport. Thanks very much to the AISTS for um, contemplating the scholarship and uh, uh, enabling this to happen and, and to provide such a great opportunity for, for these three women. And thanks again for the invitation to be here. Thank you. Thank you, and a big thank you to Anne. I hope to see you soon again here in Switzerland, or I hope at least you can stay a few days, a few more days. So it's time to start the official ceremony, but before calling our participants on stage, I would like to mention that gender balance is not a catchword at AISTS, but a reality. In this class, we have an equal number of men and women. Furthermore, this year we made available three scholarships, as you could uh, understand, the Future Female Sport Leadership Scholarship to Olivia, and two other scholarships offered by AISTS awarded to Mrs. Maria Eugenia Garcia Munoz and the windsurfing Olympian, Mr. Tony Willem, who received the Athlete Scholarship. I would like now... <laughs> I would like now to invite all the members of the Scientific Committee of the Foundation Miss Lyon, as well as Christophe Duby, to come on stage. I will also take the opportunity to present my team first, who will come also on stage. First, Amandine Bouzig, please. <laughs> Caroline Perrault. <laughs> Dominique Goba is up there, taking good care of the technique. We also have Tui, who is tweeting. <laughs> Geert, who is there. And we'll also talk to you later. And we have also Cécile bohan kazemi our new professional coach for career development, who will take care, take care of the class starting in January. Céline is there. I'm going to the call our first graduate of tonight, Mary Yang from Singapore, but she unfortunately cannot be with us tonight. <laughs> Mariel Avalos, Mexico.
Pritam Bagul, India. Leslie Bracho, Canada. Congratulations. Luis Cantarel, Spain. Bravo, Luis. Aurélie Carbon, France. Somesh Doud, India. Bravo. Maria Eugenia Garcia Munoz, Spain. Daniela Gomez da Costa, Portugal. Why don't you want us to kiss them? <laughs> Pratik Gumba, India. Mila Kovac, Czechoslovakia. She cannot be with us tonight. Geraldine Heinen, Belgium. Belgium. Miriam of Cheter, Switzerland. Sarah Holmgren, Sweden. Victoria Ivarsson, Sweden and Switzerland. Bravo. Gibran Khan, India. Congratulations. Alexander Kosik, Russia. Congratulations. Congratulations. Vijay Krishnan, India, who cannot be with us tonight.
Yulia Ladish, Belarus and Poland. She cannot be with us tonight either. Ji Yun Lee, South Korea. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Fabio Machado, Brazil. Thank you. Bravo, Fabio. Rodrigo Mendes de Siquea, Rodriguez, Portugal and Brazil. Bravo, congratulations. Thank you. Olivia Yanakitanda, Uganda. Congratulations. Congratulations. Bernardo Palmero, Portugal. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Frank Sayapet, Canada. Thank you. Bravo, Frank. Congratulations. Milad Shadman, Iran. Iran. Congratulations. Daniel Schumann, Israel. No, no, just let me. Just the let. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Daniel. Carla Spielmann, Switzerland. Bravo, congratulations. Megan Tidbury, Australia. Congratulations. congratulations. Japan. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Katarina Toima, Finland. Congrats. Thank you. Congratulations.
congratulations. Thank you. Raphael Vergniaud, France and United States of America. Merci bien. Bravo Raphaël. Merci. Arsiman Singh Virk, India. Congratulations. Shuang Wang, People's Republic of China. Thank you. Congratulations. Zhao Wang, People Republic of China. Congratulations. Ashley Wedlake, United States of America. Tony Willem, Germany. Bravo Tony, félicitations. Now that everyone is back in their seats, I would like to invite Richt and Rix for a little surprise. Please, Richt. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome, all graduates. It's great to, uh, to have you as well. As Claude said, mastering sport is not only about doing sport, but also about studying sport. And it's therefore my great pleasure and honor to announce a new award that we created, the best MSA research paper of the year. This year's winner will receive a gift card generously provided by our friends from Uxner Sport. And Vouchers and, and the candidates of this prize, they have been nominated by the academic supervisor. All research papers have been evaluated based upon a list of eight criteria. And for those of you who are not into the science, I've summarized here briefly what a good paper looks like. For those of you who are scientists, this is the formula that we used to calculate the winner. You can ask the scientific committee members to explain it to you during the cocktail. <laughs> now, without further ado, I would like to announce the winner of the MSA research paper 2013. The gold medal of the MSA 2013 research paper goes to Aurélie Carbon. You, you, you can wait here, Aurélie. 
Because because I said the gold medal, and normally when you have two winners, then you get a gold and a silver medal. But in the Olympic Games, as you know, when they have exactly the same score, I can bring back up the formula if you want to, then there are two gold medals. So the second gold medal for the best research paper of the year goes to Miriam Hofstetter. This was already a special evening, but I don't know, this could be a question to you, but if it ever happened that we had three people winning a gold medal. <laughs> I think the group was just too good because the third winner of the best research paper of the year, Victoria Iverson. And as you know, the research paper is only one component, but it's my pleasure to announce that Jean-Louis Chapelet, Professor Chapelet, will now award the winner of the award of the best student of the year. It's probably good to say that Professor Chapelet was one of the people, together with Professor Oyon, who is here as well, who were one of the founders who came with the idea of establishing a program at the MSA. So it's really excellent to have you here, and it's not a better person than to award the ceremony. So please, a round of applause for Mr. Chapla. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Gert. I'm, uh, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to be here. I'm not here as a member of the scientific committee. I'm not here as a lecturer in this program. I think I was the first lecturer this year. I'm here as the honorary president of the ISMS. It's not a well-known organization, but the ISMS is the foremost sports manager association in Switzerland. It was funded in 1996 by a group of students following one of my courses, my first courses actually in sports management back in 1995 at EDAP. And uh, it has become, uh, it has grown into the largest sports manager association in Switzerland. It is recognized by um, Swiss Olympic and uh, it has many activities. ISMS, and you can become a member now, now that you are a graduate of uh, MSA. And uh, among the activities, uh, you have uh, conferences, lectures, uh, you get uh, free tickets for major sports events, you get also a trip, but you have to pay for that. All the rest is, uh, is included in the membership. And uh, the winner of the award tonight will get a free membership for one year and a small cash prize given by ISMS. So I don't have a card, I don't have an envelope to tell who the winner is, but I have a button to press. And um, the winner is... Ah, doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam Hofstetter from Switzerland. Thank you very much, Jean-Loup. We are very happy to have you with us tonight. Thank you, ASMS and Uxner, and congratulations to Miriam, Victoria, and Aurélie. Well-deserved 
awards. I would like to ask the two class reps, Leslie and Pratek, to address now the audience, please. Good afternoon, faculty, staff, special guests, families, friends, and especially my fellow classmates, the IESTS MSA graduating class of 2013. On behalf of the graduating class, we'd like to thank you all for being here to celebrate with us today. It has been an incredible year, full of new experiences, exciting challenges, doubts, elation, frustration, and just plain exhaustion sometimes, but we made it. About 12 months ago, 41 graduate students set out on a journey most of us far from home, to pursue our passion for business of sport. Some of us had dreams of careers in sports for a long time, and others just recently after graduating from our undergrad. But we all arrived in Lausanne on a very cold January day, ready to make our career goals a reality. Settling into life in Switzerland was the first trial we faced. We had heard that the cost of living was pretty high here, but on our first trip to the grocery store, Becoming a vegetarian seemed a very viable option for survival. <laughs> of course, th those of us who spoke French, it was a little easier to, to get around and figure things out. And for those of us that did, we definitely got to know a lot of our classmates a lot faster and better by helping them to find places to live, or even trying to decipher all the, the letters from the uh, Contrôle des Habitants that we kept receiving and had no idea what they meant. Thanks to social media, we already knew the names and faces of most of our classmates before we arrived. And the first night we all met in person, obviously at the Great Escape, seemed more like meeting long lost friends than brand new ones. So here we were, an incongruous group of high achievers whose paths had crossed for only one reason. We were all about to start our master's program at the IESTS. But out of necessity, we quickly became, came to rely on one another as classmates, roommates, study partners, playmates, and most importantly, as friends. Our bonding strengthened as we shared new experiences on activity days. We tried cycling at the velodrome, curling, which even I as a Canadian had only done once, igloo building, golf, running in the Lausanne 20K, and even formed our own soccer teams, which I've now learned that I should call football teams when I'm over here. <laughs> But we were all here to gain knowledge and make connections, and through the core professors and visiting lecturers in the program, we learned many new things, like the causes and cures for dislocated shoulders, what composite materials used to make a hockey stick, the laws governing athletes in the sports industry, and the physics behind sailboats and how they move. Through individual work and team projects, we learned how the sports world works from the inside out. We experienced firsthand how the IOC prepares for the Olympic Games and the important roles international federations and national Olympic committees play in developing the successful careers of its athletes. IESTS's strength lies in its cultural diversity. This year's students represent some 25 different countries. Part of the process is to learn about each other and from each other, how our cultures contribute to the way we work. So teamwork was an essential component of the year and the teams we worked with were sometimes absolutely amazing, sometimes a little troublesome as we all learned, but having lived through these experiences, we are all confident that we can work with anyone anywhere in the world. Most importantly, however, we learned where our own skills and strengths lie. Throughout the year, we began to combine our past experiences with our new knowledge to identify the unique set of skills each one of us has to offer the world of sport. The past year was not just a step bringing us closer to our career goals, but rather a web of interwoven parts that has made us stronger individuals, able team players, and solid professionals capable of rising up to any challenge we may face on our life's journey. Some of us have found sports-related jobs already, and others are still searching for the perfect position. Stay strong. You are role models for hard work and success. In conclusion, we all arrived here from different backgrounds and with our own reasons to follow our dreams. But there are three things I know for certain. This year was a journey we will never forget. And we will always be able to call Lausanne home. And with the bonds we formed this year, we will forever be each other's Swiss family. So congratulations, class of 2013, and best of luck in achieving your dreams. <laughs> Today we are amongst the selected few who have got this prestigious degree and it's time to look back at the people who have helped us achieve this. It's time to say thank yous 
thank yous to the parents and the families who, who were there emotionally, financially, and helped us throughout this year. To professors who brought this expertise in one single classroom. To the AISTS administration, Claude, Dominic, Caroline, Geert, Claire, Amandine, and Jeremy, who are always there supporting us and who made this year really fruitful to us. To this amazing group of batchmates we have, we had great parties, football games, and it was great fun. And I would also like to mention the alumni committee who, with the mentorship program, helped us to speak to different people in the industry and helped us build ourselves. We are, our paths will again cross in future, be it Sochi, be it Tokyo, be it Rio, and who knows, one day Delhi in 2040. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Leslie and Pratik, and moreover, thank you for the nice job of representing the class over this year. So we are approaching to the end. Before I formally close the ceremony, please join me once again in applauding tonight's speakers and our graduates, as well as my team, for their great spirit and fantastic collaboration over this past year. Thank you to all for coming, parents, families, friends, and colleagues from near and far. I would like also to thank our president, Professor Yanandos Manson, for his never-stopping support and trust in our team. Thank you, Yanandos. <clears throat> AISTS will have a lot of exciting events coming up next year, so stay connected. And the last thing also I would like not to forget to uh, thank is the Swiss, Swiss Museum of Sports, Sport Swiss Museum, Schweizerische Sportmuseum. <laughs> uh, especially Mr. Simon Wahl, who came all the way from Basel, carrying the six bobsleigh that you will have the pleasure to discover after. And again, you will have even the possibility to take picture in one of these famous bobsleigh. So enjoy your cocktail and evening, drive safely home. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and until next time, enjoy sports. The class, please, after, come quickly there on the, on the stage so that we can do the, the group picture. And I officially declare the 11th graduation ceremony closed. Thank you very much. <laughs>